Warning. Collision imminent. Gravitational anomaly detected. Captain, we're rapidly approaching the Xylo black hole for gravitational assist, but our velocity is critically high. Should we change course? No. Hold steady. Full speed ahead. It's remarkable that these bizarre objects even exist. Invisible monsters of the cosmos, black holes stretch our understanding of physics to the breaking point. They're gravitational giants so dense that nothing, not even light, can escape their grasp. They twist space, warp time, and can swallow stars without a trace. Scientists have spent decades studying their nature, hoping to unlock the secrets hidden at their core. Yet, despite our advances, black holes remain among the greatest mysteries of the universe. So what exactly is a black hole? They're described by Einstein's theory of general relativity. They are distortions. In Einstein's theory, they're distortions in space-time. And their distortions are so extreme that there's a region from which light can't escape in this space-time. So the classic example is the collapse of a massive star which essentially the history is that in 1916, so only just a few months after Einstein published his theory of general relativity, Carl Schwarzschild showed how space and time are distorted around, outside, a perfectly spherical non-spinning ball of matter. So it's, it's a solution of Einstein's equations. So it tells you the distortion of space-time outside a star, a simple model of a star. Now, it turns out that in those equations, if you just keep the distortion but remove the star, but leave the, leave the mathematics there, then you have the description of a black hole. So it's in there. And actually, interestingly, if you, go, if you allow this solution to go infinitely far into the past, and so you just have this, you kind of continue it into the past, you get a description that's not only a black hole, it's a wormhole with a black hole and, and two universes and a white hole and one bit. So actually, it's all there in the mathematics from 1916. So they're very natural in that sense. The, the question becomes, as we said earlier, does nature create such things, given that it can exist? Can nature do it? And that was the debate, actually, into the 1930s. So Einstein famously, there's a very famous paper, Einstein and Rosen, Einstein, Rosen Bridge, right? It's a wormhole. That's the 30s. So they're, they're looking at the mathematics and seeing these geometries of space-time. But the question is, can you make them? And it was really a very famous paper by Oppenheimer and Schneider just before the Second World War that showed that under certain assumptions, a sufficiently massive star will, will collapse without limit at the end of its life. So nothing, What once the star starts to collapse and it, there's no nuclear fuel left and it exceeds the the limits, there's a thing called the Chandrasekhar limit and one called the oppenheimer tolman limit, I think, for neutron stars, but if it exceeds that, nothing is going to stop the collapse. So you get this geometry. There's a beautiful model of it, a rewrite of those equations called the river model of a black hole that I like a lot. So you can, you say, what is this geometry, this strange geometry that can trap light? There's a way of rewriting the equation so that you can picture space as flowing uh, towards this thing or into this thing, let's say, this black hole. And you see that there's a region of space surrounding this collapsed star where the river of space is flowing at the speed of light inwards. That line is known as the event horizon of the black hole. But the river model is nice because you can see why things can't get out because it goes, fast, it goes faster than light once it's inside. So you can see that a light ray, a photon, let's say, emitted outwards on the horizon. that You can imagine it being emitted in a river. You imagine it like a fish that's swimming in the river. And if the river is flowing inwards at the same speed that the fish can swim, then the fish just stays there, <laughs> right? So it's swimming as fast as it can, but it's frozen on the horizon. It's a beautiful 
model of what, what happens to light. So you, you can imagine light is frozen on the horizon. Uh, the river of space is flowing at the speed of light. And, and inside, then whatever you do, you're being swept inwards. You're going towards this thing, that's the singularity. But actually, there's a more, I think, a nicer way of seeing that. So if you get any general relativity textbook, you will see the singularity described not as a place in space, but a moment in time. That's how it kind of appears. If you, and, and now we can draw these beautiful maps called Penrose diagrams, where you can really see that. But that was the 1960s. So this confused a lot of people. But in what sense is the singularity a moment in time? Once you've crossed the horizon, the geometry is such that the singularity lies in your future. So it lies in your future and you cannot escape it. And that, that would be, what is such a thing? Well, that would be like tomorrow is such a thing for us. It's something in the future that we cannot escape. No matter how we move, no matter what we do, we're going to tomorrow. And so it's in that sense that this, you could say that space and time have become so distorted that they've swapped roles. So you had this, all this mathematics, this picture, was available in 1916 for the non-spinning black hole. It was in the 60s that the spinning solution was found by Roy Kerr. It's much more complicated. But the basic idea was there in 1916, but most physicists thought they wouldn't form. Oppenheimer, Schneider showed they do. Ultimately, it was Roger Penrose who really showed that they would form in the 60s again. And now we have very strong evidence that they exist. So the centre of the Milky Way, we have very strong evidence from the way that stars orbit around this central object, which is Sagittarius A star, it's called, which is a supermassive black hole. That was the Nobel Prize was awarded for that a few years ago. But now, of course, we have two images, radio telescope images of black holes, of Sagittarius A star in our galaxy and the M87 black hole um, in Messier 87 galaxy, which is a very big one. It's about six billion times the mass of the sun, that one. So these things exist. The very long answer to your short question is that they're distortions in space and time, configurations, uh, geometries, which were predicted very shortly after Einstein published his theory, and we now know to exist. And they trap light, basically. So that's, we then get into what happens when you stick quantum mechanics in. But at the moment, we've got the general, that's the general relativity bit <laughs> done. Well, Captain, this didn't work out like last time now, did it? Yeah, but this is a different animal. This is Sagittarius A-star, a supermassive black hole. Now send the beacon out. At the heart of almost every galaxy, including our own, lurks a titan on an unimaginable scale, a supermassive black hole. Millions, even billions of times the mass of our sun, these colossal entities command entire galaxies, orchestrating the motion of billions of stars. They shape cosmic evolution, spew powerful jets of radiation across millions of light years, and their voracious appetites can light up galaxies from within. Yet, as mighty and influential as they are, their origins remain a mystery. How do supermassive black holes form? I think it's probably suspected now they form by direct collapse of matter shortly after the Big Bang, not you know quite a, a way after, but they essentially collapse directly. The other option would be it's some kind of merger between lots of black holes that form from the collapse of stars. I, I think, because this is current research, current understanding is they've probably formed by direct collapse. The model is not complete yet of how those early galaxies form and how the black holes form in their centre, what role they play in the formation of the galaxies. That's um, not, it's not fully understood, it's interesting. That's why we have these, uh, you know, why we built things like the James Webb. In countless science fiction stories, we've imagined what might happen if you fell into a black hole. 
Popular culture often portrays this dramatic event as being stretched into spaghetti-like strands, a process known as spaghettification. But supermassive black holes are intriguingly different. Because of their immense size, some scientists suggest you might actually cross their event horizon without immediately feeling any dramatic effects. But could you really survive, at least for a moment, inside one of these cosmic giants? Or would you inevitably meet the same bizarre fate? A stellar mass black hole, these things like say 10, 20, 30 times the mass of the sun, what's called the tidal gravitational forces. They're the things that raise the tides on the Earth, right, in the oceans, but they're very much stronger. And uh, for small black holes, they become rather large even before you cross the horizon. But for a very big black hole, a supermassive black hole, then according to Einstein's theory, you could fall, free fall across the horizon and notice absolutely nothing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't feel the tidal forces until you were in the interior and approaching the singularity. And I said that it's inevitable that when you cross the horizon, you go to the singularity, you get swept in by this river of space, let's say, or you could say the singularity is in your future and you're going to it. Different pictures are the same thing. And you get about, it's about a day or so in a supermassive black hole. So you cross the horizon, you'd be okay for about a day. Give or, it depends on the mass, right? And that, but ultimately, you, you go to singularity, you get spaghettified, you feel the tidal forces stretched in one direction, squashed in the other, your atoms get ripped apart, and you go to the singularity, and then we don't know what happens there. As I said, in Einstein's theory, it's the end of time. It isn't, we're pretty sure, because as Stephen Hawking showed back in the 1970s, black holes radiate so they lose energy, and over time, vast amounts of time, they, they disappear, they evaporate away. And so the end of time isn't in there because ultimately everything comes back into the universe again. But that's where it gets interesting. One of the most fascinating aspects of black holes is their incredible range in size. From relatively small stellar remnants just a few times the mass of our Sun, to enormous galactic cores, these mysterious entities vary wildly. Yet scientists have discovered examples even larger than expected. Some supermassive black holes are so gigantic they challenge our very understanding of physics, raising questions about how such enormous objects can even exist without breaking apart or destabilizing their host galaxies. This remarkable scale leads us to wonder just how big can black holes actually get? So that will be set ultimately by how they form in the early universe, what the, the amount of material was, that was present that could collapse into that thing. And ultimately that goes back to the fluctuations in the distribution of the primordial ingredients of the universe so shortly after the Big Bang, the so-called ripples that we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation which most likely come from quantum mechanical fluctuations during inflation, which is before the Big Bang. So in our universe, then the, the maximum mass of a black hole will ultimately be given by those conditions that were present very shortly after the Big Bang, which likely you're talking about the theory of inflation then and how those, conditions, how those ripples came to be imprinted into the universe. But we see, as I said, we see them that are many billions of times the mass of the Sun. Perhaps the most mind-boggling idea surrounding black holes is that they could be gateways to other universes, or even creators of new realities themselves. Some physicists speculate that the conditions inside a black hole might mimic those of the Big Bang, the birth of our universe. This astonishing concept raises an extraordinary possibility. Maybe our universe began as a singularity within another, much larger cosmos, hidden behind an event horizon. Could the cosmos we live in actually exist inside a black hole, part of a greater unfathomably vast multiverse? Could our entire universe itself be contained within a black hole? I think no, in the sense that, the reason I hesitate is there are, so one of the observations to go back through history about a black hole, it was known very early on in the 1970s, 
but Jacob Beckenstein uh, showed that you can ask questions about the information content of a black hole. What, what happens to information that goes in? What we do know, and it was a very early calculation, is that the, what's called the entropy of a black hole, the information it hides, is equal to the surface area of the event horizon of a black hole in units called square Planck lengths. So it's a very interesting observation. And it's really simple. You, there's a simple calculation, actually, a back of the envelope calculation where you can show that. And it, but it's, what it means is, is not understood. It's, called, it's, it's an example of what we call holography, the holographic principle. Because you're saying that there's a region of space and whatever's in there, the information that's in there is somehow imprinted on the a boundary surrounding it, somehow, a, a dual description of this system. There is a suggestion that the universe as a whole is like that. You can consider this room, for example, in some sense we don't fully understand. Everything in this room has been specified by a theory that lives on the surface surrounding the room. So in a sense, everything's like a black hole in that sense, right? But it, you would probably more likely, it's probably more correct to say that the black holes are, are the key, the, the, a key to showing us that this is more generally true of the universe. So I don't think you can argue that we're all in the interior of a black hole, not, not least because at the moment, at least, our universe, as, as far as we see it, is, is going to exist forever and is accelerating in its expansion. And so it doesn't seem to me that you can make an argument that somewhere in this universe, as we're sat here now, there is an end of time waiting for us, as there would be inside a, a black hole. I hesitate because there are, you know, there, there are kind of pictures that suggest that at least these holographic principles are, can be applied more widely. Right. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't, go as, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say we could be living inside of a black hole, of the, the way we understand them.